Welcome to another episode of the True Crime Tales. Today's episode is called, The Death at the Beach House Mansion. This is a true story based on the death of Max Shacknight and Rebecca Zahow. What happened to Rebecca Zahow? Rebecca was born March 1, 1979, in Falam, Chin State in northwestern Myanmar. She had an older sister, Mary Zahau, along with a younger sister, Snoam Horwath, who lives in Germany, and a teenage sister, Zina Zahau, among other siblings. Rebecca moved to Nepal and then to Germany, and then she moved to the United States in her 20s around year 2001. Rebecca came from a family of Chin ethnicity and was raised as a Protestant. Her parents and most family members live in St. Joseph, Missouri. At the time of her death in July 2011, she was 32 and dating Jonah Shacknai, an Arizona millionaire who worked in the pharmaceutical industry. In August 2009, Rebecca was arrested for shoplifting after stealing $1,000 worth of jewelry from a Macy's in Phoenix, Arizona, to which she pled guilty. In 2002, she married 36-year-old nursing student Neil Nalipa of Scottsdale, Arizona. They divorced in February 2011. She worked as an ophthalmic technician until quitting in December 2010. In 2008, Rebecca began dating Jonas Shacknai, the CEO of Medici's Pharmaceutical, while she was still married to Nalipa. Shacknai's position at Medici's made him the ninth highest paid CEO in Arizona, earning $6.4 million in 2010. He had two previous marriages. His first marriage to Kimberly James resulted in a divorce and a three-year custody fight over the couple's two children. He had a son, Maxfield Aaron Shacknai, known as Max, with second wife, Dina Romano. In 2007, Jonas Shacknai had purchased the mansion known as the Spreckles Mansion in Coronado. The 27-room mansion overlooking the beach is two houses down the street from the Larry Lawrence Mansion, where Bill Clinton took his first vacation as president. It was built by John Spreckles, a well-known California businessman who made a fortune in the shipping industry, eventually acquiring several properties, newspapers, and the San Diego Street Railway System. The home is more than 12,000 square feet and it sold in March 2007 for $13 million. On July 11, 2011, Rebecca, Max, and Rebecca's teenage sister, Zena, were at the Ocean Boulevard Beach House Mansion in Coronado, California, which Shackna used as a summer estate. At some point during that day, Max fell face-first over a second-floor banister, suffering injuries to his spinal cord and facial bones, the former of which affected his heart rate and breathing. Rebecca said she was in the bathroom at the time, she found Max moments later, and Zena called 911. Max was not breathing and unresponsive and was taken to Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego at that time. She was consumed with remorse over what had happened to the boy. Later the San Diego County Sheriff said he believes Max was racing down the second floor hallway on his razor scooter when he either tripped or fell, which caused him to fall over the railing. He said the child brought down the chandelier with him. However, that answer wasn't enough for Max's mother. Dina, who in 2012 asked for her son's death to be reinvestigated. Dina hired a forensic pathologist. She wrote that a more reasonable scenario would be that Max was assaulted by another person at the hallway, near the banister of the second floor. 
Additionally, the forensic pathologist alleged that Rebecca's initial claim, that the boy said the word Ocean which was the name of the family dog before his death, would have been impossible based on his injuries. The forensic pathologist stated that, I don't have reason to believe that Rebecca killed Max. She said she thought someone else may have entered the house. Dina asked for her son's death to be looked at again. Police confirmed they would not be investigating it. Max's death is still officially ruled an accident. On July 12, 2011, Rebecca dropped off Cena at the airport for her flight back to Missouri, and then picked up Jonah Shackney's brother, Adam, who had just arrived on a flight from Memphis, Tennessee. Rebecca, Jonah, and Adam ate dinner with a friend named Howard that evening. Rebecca and Adam returned to the home, while Jonah reportedly kept a vigil at Max's bedside with the child's mother, Dina Romano. He would leave the hospital to recuperate at a nearby Ronald McDonald house. There were reports of loud music coming from the beach house later that night. On July 13, 2011, police responded to a call from Spreckles Mansion in Coronado, where the body of Rebecca was found naked with her feet bound, hands tied behind her back and a shirt stuffed in her mouth. Adam Shackney told police that he'd found her with a rope around her neck, hanging from a balcony at the mansion, and that he'd cut her down. He is thought to have been the only person home, and may have been the last person to see her alive. Since 2007, the mansion has belonged to Shackney's brother, Jonas Shackney, the multi-millionaire founder and CEO of Medici's Pharmaceutical Corporation in Scottsdale, Arizona. The police said it may have been his summer home. At the time, Rebecca was dating his brother, Jonas Shackney, a pharmaceutical tycoon who owned the mansion. Only she and Adam Shackney were staying at the mansion the night she died. The crime scene left both families in shock and the San Diego Sheriff's Department puzzled. One end of the rope Rebecca was hanging from was tied to her bed, while the other led to the balcony where police found her toe and heel prints, along with a male boot print. Detectives also found a book on a shelf in Rebecca's room titled Buckland's Complete Book of Witchcraft, which showed drawings of a ritual, a naked woman with her hands tied behind her back. The bedroom near the balcony where Rebecca was reportedly found hanging appeared staged, said a criminal psychologist. This death has many hallmarks of a ritualistic killing, he said. I think someone assaulted her physically. I think she was dazed, and they bound her. Rebecca allegedly used black paint to write the words, She saved him, can you save her, on a bedroom door near the balcony where she was found hanging. A person who has been investigating crime scenes for 15 years, believes the black paint, which was also found on Rebecca's breasts, collarbone and hands has a ritualistic overtone. The odd circumstances of Rebecca's death, including the red rope tied around her ankles and wrists, as well as the autopsy report detailing hemorrhages, bruises, and blood on the body of 32-year-old Rebecca, have raised several questions among forensic experts. According to both witnesses, the injuries as described in the autopsy report suggest a substantial blow to the head. There are four hemorrhages in four different positions, the witnesses said. When you see these kinds of scalp hemorrhages, you have to explain them. They concurred, adding, the chances of bumping into the railing, going over the balcony, and hitting your head four times is highly unlikely. San Diego Medical Examiner issued a statement to respond to press inquiries about the autopsy report. 
with regard to the hemorrhages, he said, because there was evidence that she went over the balcony in a non-vertical position, she may have struck her head on the balcony on the way down. When the body first dropped, she doesn't necessarily jump to her death, so she would drop directly downward and she could easily hit against the side of the structure from which she is hanging, he said. Even so, he admits it's not a cut and dry case. The autopsy revealed blood on Rebecca's legs, as well as bruises and tape residue. It also showed that part of a t-shirt had been in Rebecca's mouth. The medical examiner said the blood could have been either from a menstrual period or an intrauterine device, but could not explain the significance of the tape residue or t-shirt. A cryptic message, she saved him, can you save her, was scrawled using black paint in block lettering on the door of Rebecca's room. This too seems odd because the first word in this message, she, seems to have had the letter, S, added later. The letter S was in a different brush stroke, and made from what seems to be a different brush than what was used on the rest of the message. The letter S had a backwards lean to it, and the rest of the message was straight or forward slant to the letters. With this, could the message have read, He saved him, can you save her? Was this a suicide note, or a killer's taunt? Police initiated forensic and toxicology testing on her body as part of an autopsy to determine the cause of death. Speculations of foul play began early on in this case, however, Investigators were unable to find any other DNA at the scene besides Rebecca's. On September 2nd, the San Diego County Sheriff's Department formally announced their finding that Rebecca's death was a suicide. Max died on July 16th due to brain damage caused by oxygen deprivation resulting from his injuries. On July 26th, Investigators ruled Max's death as an accident, speculating that he somehow tripped. However, a trauma doctor who examined the child prior to his death and autopsy stated to police that he did not believe the injuries from his fall were consistent with the cardiac arrest and brain swelling experienced by him, suggesting that Max may have suffocated prior to his fall. On September 2nd, the San Diego County Sheriff's Department formally announced their finding that Rebecca's death was a suicide. Though the death was ruled a suicide, many people don't believe that Rebecca could have bound and gagged herself. Instead, they speculate that someone else may have been involved in her death. In the Oxygen documentary, they'll interview experts family members, witnesses, and law enforcement officials to examine all the possible theories. During their investigation, forensic specialist Lisa pointed out discrepancies in fingerprints found at the scene. Rebecca's fingerprints were developed in the bedroom, attached to the balcony, she explained. Her fingerprints were there but places that were commonly handled did not have fingerprints. During the investigation, they showed a video of how a female officer was able to first tie herself up, then slip one hand out of a noose and put it back in with her hands behind her back. They concluded that Rebecca did the exact same thing. Investigators said the boot print found was accidentally left behind by a police officer on the scene, and that only Rebecca's footprints were found on the balcony, confirming their suicide conclusion. There has been other tests done on life-size mannequins that were tied up in the same fashion as how they found Rebecca, and had a person who was the same size as Adam Shackney and about the same build and muscular body as him. The balcony was only about 15 to 20 inches wide from the doorway to the railing. 
The person was able to toss the body over the railing. It was told by the person that it was a little hard to handle the mannequin since it was just dead weight and the arms and legs dangled freely, but it was done on the first try. There might be no way to tell at this point how deep the rope penetrated the flesh on the neck, as opposed to how deep the rope marks would be on the mannequin. True crime tales would think that if they reenacted the throwing of Rebecca's body over the balcony with a true ballistic gel body, and see the rope marks on the neck and compare it to the photos before, maybe it would tell them if it would be possible to determine if that extra force or speed of being tossed the extra 20 inches would make the marks like what is in the crime photos. They estimate at the time of her death that her weight was about 100 pounds. With the rope tied to the bed leg to anchor it when she fell, the bed only moved about 6 inches. Again, with the extra force or speed of being tossed, would that bed have moved more than 6 inches or the original 6 inches reported in the crime documents? If the mannequin was tested the same way by just leaning on the balcony railing and falling over head first, would the marks be the same or different? Would the bed move six inches or less? Police questioned Adam Shackney, who had flown in from Tennessee after hearing about his nephew's fall and was the only other person staying on the mansion grounds with Rebecca at the time of her death. To remove suspicion, he agreed to take a police lie detector test the same day he found her body, but the results were inconclusive. Could not tell if he was telling the truth or not. Adam Shackney was staying in the mansion's guest house the night before and said he didn't go into the main house until the next morning, on July 13, 2011, when he discovered Rebecca's body. He cut her down from the rope and called 911. Authorities determined that she had tied her own hands and feet, gagged herself, and committed suicide after listening to a voicemail from Jonas Shackney informing her of how grave Max's condition was. After many attempts to recover the voicemail, they were unable to get the deleted voicemail. Again we wonder why would she delete the voicemail? All I can think of is that Rebecca saw what happened, felt responsible in some way, not that she did anything, but she was entrusted with Max, Jonas Shackney said, and that was too much for her to bear. Later the authorities cleared Adam Shackney of any involvement in Rebecca's death. Rebecca's older sister said that they treated my sister like garbage and I believe they came to a quick conclusion that Rebecca most likely had something to do with Max's death, and she deserved what she got. Her sister who strongly believes that Rebecca did not have a suicidal personality, took the case to the media. The Zahau family exhumed Rebecca's remains, and renowned forensic pathologist Dr. Cyril Wecht performed a second autopsy. On Dr. Phil, Wecht said he found there was enough evidence to suspect foul play. The Zahaus petitioned the California Attorney General's office to reopen the case. But, to their dismay, their petition was declined. The lawsuit claimed an eyewitness had alleged that a woman matching Dina Shackney's description had approached the mansion on the night before Rebecca Zahau's death. Police interviewed a neighbor living two doors down from the mansion, who claimed to have had heard a woman's screams and cries for help that same night. Rebecca's older sister Mary claimed that the relationship between Dina Shackney and Rebecca was not friendly. Jonah says at times, Dina made it a bit difficult for Rebecca. But Dina said that while blended families are challenging, she wanted to have a good relationship with Rebecca for Max's sake. Mary also says that when Max fell, her sister told her, she's like, 
Dina is going to kill me. What do you mean? Mary asked. Rebecca repeated, she is going to kill me, and she kind of repeated it several times. After hospital footage revealed that Dina was at the hospital the night of Rebecca's death, the attorney for Rebecca's family dropped Dina and her sister from the lawsuit and publicly apologized. Police also discounted as unreliable the neighbor's report about the cries for help. Adam Shackney is the only defendant who remains in the family's lawsuit. Rebecca's family Lewer said he believes that Rebecca and Adam Shackney had a confrontation in the main house, things between them escalated, and he killed her. Adam Shackney's attorney says Adam had nothing to do with Rebecca's death and called these claims ever-evolving and baseless, saying there is no evidence tying his client to her death. On the night of Rebecca's death, Adam Shackney says he never left the guest house. Only Rebecca's fingerprints and DNA were found at the scene, according to authorities even though Adam Shackney told them he had cut Rebecca down from the rope, then performed chest compressions and mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation in an effort to revive her. Rebecca's family lawyer also said that a handwriting expert, who had analyzed the strange message painted on the bedroom door, believes there are similarities between it and Adam's handwriting. Adam Shackney's legal team, however, used its own expert who says handwriting on paper can't be compared to painted block letters because of the differences in the surfaces, writing instruments, and ink versus paint. Jonas Shackney, who was Rebecca's boyfriend, believes that his brother is innocent of any wrongdoing, and that the lawsuit is outrageous. Rebecca's family still blamed Adam Shackney, Rebecca's boyfriend's brother for her passing. Though he was never charged criminally, reports are that Rebecca family did sue him in a civil case that ruled in their favor, awarding them $5.1 million in damages. However, it is reported in February 2019 that the case had been thrown out and that Adam Shackney's insurance company settled for only $600,000. Shackney was outraged that the insurance company covering his legal exposure settled with Rebecca's family attorney, without his knowledge or involvement. He told the press a week later that the settlement was for $600,000. He said he never saw the amount with his own eyes, but said that was the amount his lawyer told him. He told members of the media outside court that his insurance company believed in his innocence, but was tired of throwing money at his legal defense. Adam Shackney called the judge incompetent for allowing the settlement to be reached without any comments from himself or his attorney. San Diego County Sheriff's Department is still looking for any information that anyone might have or heard about this case to help bring closure to Rebecca's family. Thanks for listening to another podcast of the True Crime Tales. Please come again and remember. Please subscribe.